Greetings, free people, West Indian paradigm. Yeah, man, everything we're going forward is from a West Indian perspective. So it's an Indian paradigm, specifically West Indian paradigm. Now, what's a Jamaica constitution, an enforceable contract, we go on to say there is no higher duty than that which one owes to himself. To thine own self be true. It is self-evident that the God of nature, our creator, is the sovereign of the universes and everything in it, as well as the men and women whom Yah our great spirit endowed with certain unalienable rights, making them self-directing sovereigns. This means that all governments instituted among men derive their just powers only from the consent of the men or women who agree to be governed. The men and women together as a union Unit are the true source of earthly power and authority. Hence, all attempt to exercise any powers not conveyed by the men and women is unjust and unauthorized. And any act done pursuant to such usurpation of power is void. It is also self-evident that our sovereign creator's temporal laws for men and women are expressed in the common law of the land. We'll go on to say there are three basically, there are three basically, uh, there are basically three types of laws. We have the law of God, which encompasses the laws of nature. Number two, we have the law of the land, also referred to as the common law. Number three, we have private law, also referred to as contract law. There are basically three types of legal system. Well, we have the common law, we have the equity law, and you have admiralty law. We we'll go on to say private law or contract law is that law which comes into being when men and women enter into agreements, creating the rules and terms by which they agree to be bound together. State and federal constitutions are examples of private law. They come under the heading of contract law because they are the contract that establish governments and, and are designed to protect the men and women from the government, to restrain, restrict, confine, and limit the acts, action, or activities performed by the state to keep the government agency under control. The Jamaica Constitution, Chapter 3, Charter of Rights and Freedoms are private contractual offers which bind the public officers by oath to the public office if accepted. The oath is the instrument of the contract which stipulate the rules and terms by which the accepting parties agree to be bound. The chapter also makes the charter also makes provision that safeguard the men and women's fundamental rights and freedoms. Now, when we talk about about oath, there is always you know certain restrictions in order to you know maintain correctness. So, them say whoever have taken an oath before a competent tribunal officer or person in any case 
in which the constitutional laws authorizes an oath to be administered willfully and contrary to such oath state or subscribes any material matter which he does not believe to be true is guilty of perjury and shall be fined no more than two thousand dollars or in prison no more than five years or both and this is public law you find it in other 18 usc section 1621 now it's a public law a form of private law that results when laws are made in proper application of the delegated authority conveyed to the legislator now it's the title 18 the federal criminal code is an example of public law it was drafted to grant unto non-citizen the protection and defense the citizens have under common law that portion public law is that portion of law which deals with the powers rights duties capacities and incapacities of governments in its political capacity considered in its quasi private personality i.e that is as capable of holding or exercising rights or acquiring and dealing with property in the character of an individual so this is a public law deal with now the devil switch in 1938 the united states abandoned the public law and adapted an unconstitutional system called public policy a milestone was reached in the conspiracy to overthrow the rights and freedoms of the people with the U.S. Supreme Court's 1938 decision in the Erie Railroad case, because of which all Supreme Court's decision prior to that time are, are being treated as no longer relevant in equity court proceedings. Now, I was looking at public policy. Public policy, the rules and procedure policy of a foreign sovereign over its subjects it holds that no subjects can lawfully no subject can lawfully do that which tends to be injurious to the public or against the public good as defined by the foreign sovereign public policy is set by legislative acts and pursuant thereto by judicial and administrative promulgating of rules and regulations we call it legal standards such rules and regulations are therefore non-laws but rather let me repeat that such rules and regulations are therefore not laws but rather terms imposed by contract agreements. It is the contracts themselves which make those rules and regulations binding. If you are not a party to those contracts, not a subject, property of the government, you can make yourself a party by volunteeringly or volunteering to comply. So if you are not a subject, you can make yourself a subject by volunteering to comply. But once you decide to play the game, you are compelled by the rules of that game to continue to play. Once you are compelled, the best way out is to reassert your self-directing sovereign authority and rights. The very concept of public policy and its inherent Inherent usurpation of the power from the self-directing sovereign men and women is so widely accepted by bureaucrats in all levels of government that they act as if they are the masters over the men and women of this earth. <clears throat> Administrative law a term used to describe private law that comes into existence when a foreign sovereign 
acquires dominion over native men and women and can dictate to them what law is. Title 26, the Internal Revenue Code of the IRS is an example of administrative law along with other titles classified by the U.S. Congress as non-public administrative law. Thus, these administrative laws apply only to subjects of the foreign sovereign, which represent the state and federal government. That's not good. Mm -hmm. I'm recording. I'm recording. Sorry. Admiralty Maritime, the body of law that governs navigation and shipping. It includes substantive laws and procedural laws. Let me repeat that again. Admiralty Maritime, this is where everybody sees going on. This is the body of law that governs navigation and shipping. This is why we say it's the law of the sea, contrary to Contrary to the common law of the land. So again, we're going to touch on this. Admiralty slash maritime. Admiralty maritime law is a body of law that governs navigation and shipping. It includes substantive law and procedural law or procedural rules. Are really, the procedural rules are formulated and created by a legislative act, which means it's, it's, it's our legal standard used alternatively as rules and regulation. So that's procedural, now substantive. Let's go into the definition. Substantive law, law which governs the original rights and obligation of the individuals. Let me repeat that. Substantive laws are laws which governs the original rights and obligations of the individual. Substantive law may derive from the common law, statutes, or a constitution. Example, a claim to recover for breach of contract or negligence or fraud would be a common law substantive right. Number two, we say a state or federal statute giving an employee the right to sue for employment discrimination would also create a substantive right. Additionally, in Sidback versus Wilson, 1941, illustrate how courts may approach the question of whether a law is substantive. There, the U.S. Supreme Court in ruling that an order for a party to undergo a medical examination was a procedural, not a substantive matter. Place weight on the fact that no such, no such substantive right exists in common law and no such statutes touches on the matter. Now, we can repeat this because you have a lot of judges audacious enough for order psych psychological evaluation onto the man and woman when it has nothing to do with common law or substantive law. However, if you're a subject slave, then you'll be compelled to these things. This is why we have to reassert our self directing sovereign authority and right. We have to reassert these things because these things are secured, guaranteed by the Jamaica Constitution as amended 2011 by assent. So these things are law. Now we're going on to say procedural law. Procedural law are laws that establishes the rules of court and the method used to ensure the rights of the individual in the court system. So you see what procedural law is. It will deal with the rules of the court and the method used to ensure the rights of the individual. Two different systems at play right here. 
two separate and distinct systems, one substantive, deriving from the common law, and one is procedural, which would be deriving from some legislative acts. Now, number one, particularly laws that provide how the business of the court is to be conducted. Example, may be pleading requirements, discovery rules, or standards of review. Number two, in the U.S. federal court system, the Rules Enabling Act of 1934 gives the Supreme Court of the United States shall have the power to prescribe by general rules for the district courts of the state and for the courts of the District of Columbia, the form of process rates pleading or motions and the practice and procedure of civil action at law. And all of these are procedural law. Number three, the results has been the federal rules of civil procedure which provide a comprehensive guide as to how federal courts could, should conduct the administration of justice. Number four, note, however, that the federal rules of civil procedure apply only to civil actions and not the state rules of procedure. Each state shall follow their own system of civil procedural rules, many of which are modeled on the influence of the federal rules. Now, the federal court system also has a system of rules of criminal procedure. Rules of criminal procedure differ from those of civil procedure in that they include rules governing preliminary proceedings specific to criminal proceedings such as arrest, they include ruling, govern grand juries and indictments, arraignments and notice of defense and particular issues pertaining to criminal trials. So we are talking about federal court systems and the rules of criminal procedure, which is separate and distinct from the rules of civil procedure. Distinct, separate and apart from substantive right, procedural laws can nevertheless greatly influence the case. In his dissent, in Sabak versus Wilson, Justice Frank Further highlighted the important difference between substantive and procedural law in stating a drastic change in public policy in a matter deeply touching the sensibility of people or even their prejudice slash injury as to privacy, i.e. substantive right, ought not to be inferred from a general authorization to formulate rules for the more uniform and effective dispatch of business on civil on the civil side of the federal courts. In other words, I must say, boy, I can't use the generality to infer or prescribe no kind of condition upon the man or woman. Basically, that's what they're saying. When you deal with man and woman, you have to deal with specificity. You have to be specific. And substantive laws deal with specificity, while the procedural laws usually deal with generality. And we know as a maxim, anything we are deal with generality, usually I deal with deceptive behavior and conduct. Now, it's, uh, in the Supreme Court, landmark in the Supreme Court's landmark Erie Railroad Company versus Tompkins decision in 1938, the court declared that federal courts must follow state substantive law, but that no one doubts federal power over procedural law. Yeah, the Maga have power over procedural law. That's theirs. That's the Admiralty area. That's the law of the sea area. Only because procedural law is inferior to substantive law. So this is information I will share, and I'd like people to pay attention to the area where we are talking about, you know, the substantive law definition where we say 
the Supreme Court in ruling that an order for a party to undergo a medical examination such as psychological evaluation was a procedural and not a substantive matter. This place weight on the fact that no such substantive right exists in common law and no such statutes touches the matter. So these guys are doing their own thing. And I think this is a ruse where they can get people inside of them facility where they have their own private doctor misdiagnose people who them deem a threat. Out here. Basically, that's what it is. Now we're gonna move forward because I'm not they are all day in a man, but when we have information for push, we don't mind to share it. The rights of the individuals are not derived from governmental agency, either municipal, state, or federal, nor even from the constitution. The individual's rights existed. Let me blow this thing up. Individual rights exist inherently in every man and woman by endowment of the creator and are merely reaffirmed in the constitution and restricted only to the extent they have been voluntarily surrendered by citizenship to the agency of government. So you have inherent right, but you surrender them when you, when you, when you subscribe to be in to the agency of government. Yeah, when you subscribe by citizenship to the agency of the political government. The people's rights are not derived from the government, but the government's authority derived from the people. The individuals owe no duty to the state since he received nothing therefrom beyond the protection of his life and property. His rights are such as ex existed by the law of the land long antecedent to the organization of the states. He owes nothing to the public so long as he does not trespass upon their rights. So ones and ones need to consider them kind of information here, specifically our public service authority with some of these dunce people saying they are in a leadership role. It's amazing to be a legislator. You don't need no kind of training, no kind of apprenticeship, absolutely nothing. Yet, every other profession, you have to go through some form of apprenticeship, except being a legislator. This is why I'm in a room for lit fire upon these. You know? Buto. People, what me I say, I said, them are bureaucrats in government. You people are beneath us as a people. And that's being nice. Now, we have to say, listen, government of Jamaica, it is not necessary to challenge the presumption or the proposition or the offer that as a general rule, the state having power to deny a privilege altogether may grant it upon such condition as it seems fit to impose. Again, if the state having power to deny a privilege altogether may grant it upon such condition as it sees fit to impose, but the power of the state is not unlimited and one of the limitation is that the state may not impose conditions which require the relinquishment of constitutional rights if the state may compel the surrender of one constitutional right as a condition of its favor it may in like manner compel a surrender of all it is inconceivable that guarantees embedded in the Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedom may thus 
must be manipulated out of existence. Yeah, man. Abomination. The state promotes and relies on the general misconception that any statute passed by a legislator is valid. It is impossible for both the Constitution and a law violating said Constitution to be valid. One must prevail. This is succinctly stated as follows. One, the general rule is that an unconstitutional statute, though having the form and the name of law, is in reality no law, but is wholly void and ineffective for any purpose since unconstitutionality dates from the time of its enactment and not merely from the date of the decision so branding it. An unconstitutional law in legal contemplation is as inoperative as if it has never been passed. Number two, since an unconstitutional law is void, the general principles follow that it imposes no duty, confers no right, creates no office, bestows no power or authority on anyone. It affords no protection and justifies no acts performed under it. No one is bound to obey an unconstitutional law and no courts are bound to enforce it. And you'll find this information in 16 Amjur, second and section 177. Number three, the general rule is that an unconstitutional act of the legislator protects no one. It is said that all persons are presumed to know the law, meaning ignorance of the law excuses no one. If any person acts under an unconstitutional statute, he does so at his own peril and must take the consequences. 16, I'm juror second. Section 178. Number four, where rights are secured by the constitutions, where rights are secured by the constitution, where rights are secured by the constitution are involved, there can be no method of fix up this there can be no rule making or legislation which would abrogate them so it's uh, where rights are secured by the constitution there can be no rule making or legislation which would abrogate those very laws and this is miranda versus arizona this is what i'm called the miranda right here on the island jamaica now present the people with no miranda rights in fact jamaica presume the people them um, a slave and then they have no rights really yeah man them totally hide chapter three charter of fundamental rights and freedom them hid that information from the people well it's incumbent on the people to find this information for themselves anyway let's wrap it up now for a law to be proper it must be just. It must protect equally the rights of all without violating the rights of any. There is nothing mysterious about proper law. It is based on the reasonableness and common sense and a harmonious and are harmonious with the laws of God. I'll finish up here now, baby. Our eyes. are useless if the heart is silent and the mind is blind. Remember, law is whatever we consent to, for contract is the binding agreement that makes law. Again, law is whatever it is we choose to consent to. Why? 
because the contract is the binding agreement which makes the law. Finally, we have said sworn truth. Sworn truth is the foundation of the law, commerce, and the whole legal system consists in telling the truth. Again, sworn truth. The foundation of the law, commerce, and the whole legal system consists in telling the truth. I solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God, this is these officers' oath. Either by testimony or by deposition or by affidavit. Every honorable judge requires those who are presented before them to be sworn or affirm to tell the truth and is compelled by the high principles of their profession to protect and seek out the truth. Complete gratitude. Again, or complete gratitude. Yeah. So, again, we just share information as usual, you know, in an effort to bring honorable clarification. And yes, West Indian paradigm. Yeah. And, you know, this is one of the new logo going forward. And this is where we are pay homage to where ancestors from the Almec, you know what I mean, the Zoltecs, come all the way back down to the Incas, the Aztecs, to the Mayan, right back around to the Arawak. So we do give thanks for the true expression. Again, the brave may fall, but never yield, and we say bold and brave, firm and strong. Salute, free people, complete respect. With power do I first lady, like you, there is no other out there. Complete gratitude for your presence within our life. Near a moment last forever. Give thanks, free people. Give thanks. <laughs>